Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Tom McIntosh. I'm going to be your host. I'm the uh, Interim Associate Dean Research and Graduate Studies for the Faculty of Arts. Each year, the Faculty of Arts is pleased to present the Stapleford Lecture, funded through the generosity of Ernest William, William Stapleford and Maud Bunting Stapleford Lecture Fund. This endowed trust was established by the late Elsie Stapleford in memory of, of her parents. Elsie's father, the Reverend Ernest Stapleford, was the second president of the Regina College, then a campus of the University of Saskatchewan, and he's widely considered to be a formative president for laying the groundwork uh, for what would become the University of Regina. As an intellectual, an activist, and a great supporter of the arts, Maud Bunting Stapleford was extremely active in the cultural and political spheres and an influential voice for expanding the legal rights for women and children. And like her mother, Dr. Elsie Stapleford was also a great advocate of children's rights. One of her lasting achievements was helping to create and implement the 1946 Ontario Day Nurseries Act, which served to ensure standards of care, licensing, licensing requirements and government funding to day nurseries and nursery schools, which in turn helped transform the regulation and delivery of daycare uh, and childcare in Canada. And it's through the generosity, whoops, uh, of the Stapleford Memorial Endowment and its donors uh, that allows the University of Regina's Faculty of Arts to present uh, this annual lecture. So I want to thank the th members of the Stapleford Committee for their selection of tonight's lecturer and for the staff in the Dean of Arts Office, Milagros Chárez, especially for her, their work in bringing this all together so that we can be here this evening. Tonight's lecture deals with one of the most sensitive and controversial aspects of end-of-life care, the ability of an individual to choose to end their life and to seek the assistance of medical professionals in doing so. The debate over what used to be called assisted suicide came to the forefront of Canada's politics with the case of Sue Rodriguez, who is the subject of a 1993 Supreme Court of Canada case that upheld the criminal code provisions against medical assistance in death, even for those facing a terminal illness and potentially a long, slow, and painful death. While it had appeared that the matter would become settled law after the Rodriguez case, the Supreme Court effectively reversed itself in 2015 when it held in Carter versus the Attorney General that indeed, quote, mentally competent adults who are suffering intolerably and enduringly have the right to a doctor's assistance in death. As Canada adapted to this reversal in the law and instituted its initial response to the ruling, a host of subsequent questions also began to be raised. Could the right be extended to those below the age of majority? Could it be extended to those whose mental health rather than their physical health was seemingly incurable? And these questions came amid a whole host of issues raised by the original structuring of Canada's made regime, not the least of which was the ever-present concern that the right to medical assistance in dying did not become an obligation to choose such assistance and that no one, whatever their health status, be coerced in any way into making this decision. So I think it's fair to say that there is no issue facing Canada's medical care system that has quite as many ethical, legal and moral challenges as does MAID. And so we're fortunate tonight to have one of Canada's leading experts in this area, someone with real experience grappling with all of the tangled complexities that it presents us as a nation. Dr. Lillian Thorpe is a geriatric psychiatrist with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, as well as professor in the departments of community health and epidemiology, psychiatry, and gerontology? Geriatrics. Added that found out at dinner, at the University of Saskatchewan. She is a, a member of the former Saskatoon Health Region Committee, which developed the medical assistance in dying policy and has been involved with the assessment and clinical MAID provisions throughout the province since 2016. In May, she was in, an invited witness to the Canadian Parliamentary Special Joint Committee on Medical Assistance in Dying, whose results, whose report was published, in fact, in, uh, today. 
Currently, she serves as a member of the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers Working Group, which works to develop curriculum for assessing capacity in patients with comorbid mental illness in applying for medical assistance in dying. She is also a member of the Saskatchewan Health Authority and Saskatchewan Cancer Agency Joint Ethics Committee and is actively involved in MAID-related research and teaching. As I said, there could be no one better to, to bring uh, uh, to bear her intellect to this topic. And so please help me welcome the 2023 Stapleford Lecturer, Dr. Lillian Thorpe. Thank you very much. Uh, I might just leave it on, on turned off here because there was a bit of feedback, so I'll, I will just talk this way. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's wonderful to see a room full of people who are interested in this really challenging topic. And I love, I love to be back in Regina. I did my undergraduate degrees here in physics and math. And my father was a history professor here. And I came to Regina in, when I was 15 from New Zealand. And, and I ended up in Toronto, did my master's and then medical school and ended up in Saskatoon. So it's wonderful to be back. The campus is a bit bigger than when I, when I left, although we've occasionally come back for various things often related to my colleague Thomas Sergisteropoulos back there, who does a lot of really neat things around aging. And Regina's got lots of neat stuff happening. And, and so it's really an honor to be asked to, be talk to, to, to talk to this group. It is obviously taken up much of my life for the last seven years now. I'm also on the, the, the most active committee is really the Health Canada Committee looking at professional standards. We're all struggling with how we do this to balance the autonomy versus the, the, the risks we have to people, the vulnerable people particularly. And as somebody who has spent her life working with vulnerable adults, including disabilities and then older people with cognitive impairment, it's, it's really a, a big always a big concern for us, how, how we balance that. And I'm always happy to see a lot of debate from all sides of the spectrum because it, representing different ideas keeps us centered. And, and it's important to stay centered because we don't want to go too much one way or the other either. So here's, we're going to, um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the general, uh, so this is my, just my, really, my disclosures. I do get some money from CAMUP for developing these training guidelines. For your information, there is no standardized training right now for made assessors across the country. I think this is a major issue and we are working on this nationally. We have an, a number of different committees working on different aspects. It is very important. So it's so new that um, when we started this, we were flying by the seat of our pants, trying to figure out what's right, what we balance and how we do this, how we assess the capacity, all of those kinds of things. And I got involved because I do a lot of capacity assessments and the most complex ones in the region I was doing and I was doing the teaching. So that's how I got involved. It was something I actually was initially opposed to and um, just with my background, but I've obviously become to be quite involved. And I've done, I think, close to, get it close to 900 assessments, less than half go all the way. Many people apply for the sake of the comfort of knowing they could have a peaceful death, but many do not do this knowing that they have an option. So, so I do have some grants, from, money from Health Canada. I haven't got it yet, but apparently I'll have some eventually from working on this many hours a week. And again, tomorrow we're, we're battling on some things. So, so you've already heard my, my background. So, so the overview is really, I'm going to talk to you a bit about why we're talking more about this. You, you heard about some of the legal stuff, but, but part of this is that we're all getting older. And um, as we get older, we all die. 100% of us will die. Like, there's everybody in this room will die. So we talk more about this now as we all get older and the issues of dying become more important to us to talk about and everything related to our aging process. And some of us in the geriatric area have worked a lot on Reform Aid about how we look at uh, goals of care so that we, we, we back off on some of those things that are no longer bring, bringing people quality of life. They may extend life, but not quality of life. How do we back off on some of those treatments when people are in the la latest six months of life? And 
a few years ago, I did a project, one of my, my, my residents, looking at medications in a dementia unit in people who were at, anticipated to live another six months. People are often on over 20 drugs. And those drugs often are the reason I get referred to because people are objecting to taking this, spitting them out and pushing them. And I get non-compliant patients. And this is somebody who's in the, really the dying process. So, so we've talked a lot over the last few years, increasingly so, about how we really back off on some of these interventions because we all die. And how do we keep our dying process comfortable? And so some of that is in those interventions. Others are in improving palliative care. And some of you, and I'll talk briefly about this report that was actually came out last night, right after I finished my slides. So I had to update them. And, and how do we improve some of that access to palliation? And then really the last step and the least common step is medical assistance in dying. So it's very much in the news, but it's much less common than all of the other things that we do. So many clinical, legal, and ethical challenges with this, very polarized right now at many levels. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that continuum of care and this difficult balance between autonomy and protection. So our population pyramid, so this is what it looks like. I got the most recent one here. So big bulk of us into sort of late 50s, 60s, we're the aging baby boomers. We're all getting older, those of us who are still around. Some, of us, some people have died early, so we're the healthy survivor group, those of us who've made it over 60. And you can see here the red is in the women and the, the blue is in the men. And not that many people in the oldest age groups, but this bump is moving its way up. And we have increasing numbers of people in the older age groups where we anticipate more deaths. So this is life, this is because we've been successful at improving life expectancy. And life expectancy going up over time, red in women, blue in men over the years. Now, interestingly, it looks like it's not maybe going up anymore now with some changes in our young people having um, less exercise, um, a little bit more obesity and, and a little bit more immobility there. So it looks like maybe not going up anymore, but it has been going up a lot so that particularly the oldest groups over 95 is the fastest age cohort in a population. So 95 and out, out older, and they're successfully, many of them living into that age. And our goal is to have healthy, um, depend, independent life as long as possible. And then when the dying process happens, have that be a peaceful process. So my dad is almost 92. He's still actively reading and writing and so on. I hope he'll do that live as long as he can, like his mother did, who was still up in a tree, sawing off branches when she was on her 90th birthday. Couldn't find her, I found her feet. I saw her feet in a tree. We were going out to see her for her 90th birthday, she had a pair of feet, and my grandmother was up there and I could hear the sawing, she's sawing branches. So uh, yeah, so, so this is what's happening, and our older population is taking over the younger population. This is looking at older people over 65, and you can see there used to be a lot more younger ones, and older ones are taking over the general population, having lots of impact on lots of aspects of our lives. So particularly then, we, um, we start talking more about death, and I think it's not surprising that this whole, whole dialogue is happening, that we're talking more about death. Woody Allen, not afraid of death, I just don't wanna be there when it happens. And um, we are very afraid of talking about death and made has been good for getting us talking about death. A lot of our patients that I talk to say that their families don't wanna talk about it. They say, mom, don't talk about it, you'll live forever, it's great, you're just, just, just don't even think about that. And what they tell me is that I really wanna talk about it. I wanna talk about the fact that I will be dying. I need to talk about this. And, and many of my patients I talk to who, are, who discuss end of life things never do made, but they really appreciate the chance to talk about their dying process and what they would like without. So here's what we die of. So, so you guys maybe know a lot of the stuff. What kills us off is heart disease, uh, both men and women. You can see all the other stuff. We now die, where we live long enough that we die of diseases of old age and that take longer to kill us often. And sometimes not very pleasantly, like cancers. Even with the best palliative care, sometimes is very difficult dying process. So. Um, what used to kill us was infectious diseases at the turn of the last century. That is not what kills us anymore in our developed countries. 
So, so what's also, many other things have changed. We used to, years ago, die at home. My maternal grandmother died at home. She never wanted to go to hospital. She was much older. And those generations died at home and around the families and in a scene where they wanted to be. And then the healthcare system changed so that people ended up expecting to go to hospital. So we developed a sanitized medicalized death where people died in hospital. We did not see death anymore. We stopped talking much about death and it was nicely hidden away. And so, so you can see in, in from the 1950s, you can't read all the stuff, but what this is talking about, what percentage of deaths are in hospitals. So you can see it was still going up in the middle of the last century, going up, 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 the percentage of deaths in hospital. And, and so that medicalization, but what you see in the last bit there is a starting drop off in deaths in outside the hospital, which is largely in the home or in hospice and other places. And I think that's a very good thing. So, and this is the last data I picked up from Stats Canada last week, and so you can see this increasing, increasing pattern happening that we are, are accepting that people often want to die in familiar circumstances. And so we're a little different across the province. Um, Saskatchewan, actually, we're pretty good. Like, we have one of the lower rates of death in hospitals, which is good. Um, so. Some of the not so good things. We do a lot of things that are not good for people and not actually helping people at the end of life. We resuscitate people that are dying. We put them on all kinds of complex treatments when they're clearly dying. We uh, give them antibiotics. An old guy of mine who's in hospital, we had a lengthy talk with his family. I said, look, you know, he's always said he doesn't want interventions. Why are we testing his blood? Why are we doing his blood pressure every day? Why are we doing blood work every day? He, his advanced care director said he didn't want any of this stuff. So we were successfully able to change that. But we do a lot of the stuff that is not good in, in the dying period. And this shapes a lot of our, has, I think, shaped a lot of our drive towards MAID because MAID, want, MAID uh, allows people to have a peaceful death. So before I go into MAID even, I want to say that our general principles really are um, to de-prescribe functioning in functional improvement. We look at what's actually helping people anymore. We look at the, the treatments. Are they actually, um, the time needed for benefit. So some drugs take many, many years to work. And when you're in the dying stages, don't really make any sense. So what can we stop? Then palliative care. And really the last is made. And that's what we're talking about made today. But it really is the end part of this continuum. It's not the first. And so what is a good death? So a good death, ideally, this is from World Health Organization 1997, still what we think, free from avoidable distress and suffering by family, patient, family, and caregivers. And we want, ideally, to have that in the way people want, in according to their wishes, and fitting with their clinical, cultural, and ethical standards. That's a good death. That's what we feel is a good death. So um, now people have actually, we're not the first ones to talk about ending people's lives when they get old and frail. So here is Anthony Trollope's book and talking about um, um, uh, the age was um, fixed at 67, at which time a citizen's deposition was to take place, removal to the college in the town of Necropolis followed by departure and subsequent cremation one year later at the age of 68. So this is to spare them undignified suffering. So this is not a new book. This is 1882. People were talking about this. Not necessarily in a good way, of course. William Osler, we revere him. William Osler said, an institute should be established to which men, by the way, I, I'm glad I'm a woman here. Right? So it's just the man, this is the man. The men aged 60 years and over could retire for a year of quiet contemplation before a peaceful departure by chloroform. William Osler. So I have a whole bunch of other slides that are like this and pictures like this, most of them in rather bad taste. My husband says I shouldn't show them, so I'm not showing them. I have the worst collection of death-related jokes, too. So you have to cheer yourself up a bit. So here's the women you just heard about. You heard Tom talk about these three women that change the law. 
women did it. Sue Rodriguez, she was highly important because she got the dialogue going about, she had ALS, dreadful death, ALS, you eventually choked to death, not a good death. And she wanted to have a peaceful death. And she actually did have assistance eventually, but not in the legal way. And that's never been publicly, completely identified who did. We all think we know who did. But, but she got the dialogue going. And even although that didn't go through, make its way successfully through the Supreme Court, what it did is get us all talking about this. And by the time Kay Carter, who is, by the way, 89 and had spinal stenosis, nothing immediately killing her. She had a few years of life left. She, um, that, that story went, made its way up much more successfully, along with Gloria Taylor, who had ALS. So Kay Carter did end up going to Switzerland. She died in Switzerland, which has had um, made equivalent for a long time. And Gloria Taylor actually died of natural death of sepsis. But they got this story going, and they got this through the Supreme court. So very courageous women when, when, when they did this, and it was much less accepted. So then they drove this bill, C-14, June 16th, that was trying to then allow people to have autonomy over the dying process, and especially to deal with the suffering that many people have in the dying process. Cancers are not nice. ALS is not nice. Many ways we die are not comfortable. <coughs> So it tried to address concerns about vulnerable populations and the slippery slope. Now, we've got a slippery slope now. Things have been expanding quite considerably, and many people feel that it's gone too fast. And so there's a lot of concern about how that's gone. Most of you know that made for soul mental illness has just been deferred. And it's, it's a challenge, some of this. So, the, but the bill tried to try to be fair and even-minded. It said nobody had to pr formally participate. So, when people do not think this is right, you do not have to be involved. You have to make people make sure people know their know their options. Refer them on to someone if if you can't tell them or you don't want to. Just make sure they know their options. But you don't have to be involved. And we respect the fact that people, some people, are really really uncomfortable with this, and that's okay. It's okay to have different opinions and feelings, and we respect that. I think, as I said before, it's healthy that we have a variety of opinions in the world. So eligibility criteria have to be 18 or over. The report that was just published last night, came out last night, I'll show you some of the extracts from this later. You have to be 18, but the report is suggesting it now mature minors will be included, which I think makes sense because how is a 17-year-old dying of a horrible cancer knows exactly what is dying with? How is that different from an 18-year-old? So, so that's been a debate for a while. The big debate is going to be how you put the safeguards in, and so that will all be in process. But so you have to be 18 right now. You have to have capacity to understand those decisions, and you have to make a voluntary request that is not the result of external pressure. It's not the family member uh, promoting this, which is still sometimes the case, uh, saying, actually, I had to need to hear from your mom. And, and each time I, um, we have two people here from our MAID program. And, and so Pam and Deborah here on our, our second row back, shake your hand. So they know lots of practical stuff if anyone wants to talk to them. So um, we do have some of those cases where each time I've gone to see a patient, they said, no, no, doesn't want it. And then the, then the daughter or the son says, oh yes, yeah, she wants it. So, so some of those, but so it has to be that person. You have to give informed consent, which means they have to, Receive the information and understand the information, which is not the same thing. Telling people something is not the same thing as understanding it. So have to understand it, internalize it, might take a bit of work. And then they have to have bad stuff that's not getting better. So what the law called this is grievous and irremediable medical condition, a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. So mental illness solely was excluded. So bad stuff that's not getting better and to be advanced quite a bit. So it's a fun affected that person's functioning considerably. So it is not one of the patients who has got a bit of twitching from ALS but is still able to work and get around and so on. You have to be in a state of considerable decline of capability or functionality. So not the early stages but the later stages and have a lot of suffering which could be physical and psychological and that's or decline. So that can't be relieved by conditions that person considers acceptable. So I've underlined this last bit because this is causing us all a lot of trouble. 
And sorry, yeah, it's a bit low for some of you. So what it says is that the, they have to have suffering that is intolerable and can't be relieved by conditions they consider acceptable. So what that means is we're getting people that have conditions they're suffering from that actually have very treatable suffering and they say, I don't have to do it. And so it is a bit difficult for us, that line. We all understand people can choose what treatments they want, but on the other hand, if you don't try anything, I find that a really difficult thing. And so most of the time, I personally am saying, I'm just not comfortable with this. I, I need to know that some things have actually been tried. And the expert panel on soul mental illness has also come across and said this. So those are criteria. So you have, for C14 required a natural, a reasonably foreseeable natural death, which was very flexible. So it, it, it meant that, like Kay Carter, she was going to die in a few years with spinal stenosis, she had horrible pain, but it didn't mean immediately. So you didn't have immediate death, didn't say six months, didn't say two weeks, but reasonably foreseeable, you could tell this person is in that state within a few years of dying. So that was C14, and that's how we worked for the first few years doing this. And um, then there was a, another patient-driven initiative. This whole MADE process has been patient-driven. It was the initial patients I showed you, um, and now the second part of this is again patient-driven. Trushan Gladue, these were two people with you see here, John Trushan and Nicole Gladue. They had, uh, G John Trushan had cerebral palsy and Nicole Gladue had post polio syndrome. So they had a not quickly foreseeable death, but they felt that there is considerably suffering and that they should have the right to have a peaceful death as well. So it was patient driven, it went through, it drove Bill C7, which then said that people do not have to have reasonably foreseeable natural death. So this means that people who might live another 30 years might have access, might be eligible. So you can see how for all of those involved with us, this is much more difficult for us. Much, much more difficult. And the, 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 um, the risks of cutting off a lot of life are there when you have someone who can apply when they're not dying for many years. So this B C7 said that, um, so for people who don't have reason before foreseeable death, you have to wait longer. So you have to wait at least 90 days, and that's a minimum to make sure that the person really knows what they're doing, and it could be much longer. So I, one of my patients had, had an, a spinal cord injury. I really wasn't comfortable that she'd really come to terms with this, had all the, all the help she could. Her children, she had three children. She, um, I wanted to make sure her children were prepared, and she t it was two years for her. And I feel that was the right thing for her because she, at that point, by the end, the children were prepared. They all had counseling, and I could somewhat live with it. I'm not happy with it, but I could live with it. So, um, so 90 days, and we have to make sure that those people have access to appropriate care and consultation with people who, who can really look and, and explore the, the reason that they're suffering. So we have to consult someone who knows that illness. So we have to get, say if it's MS, I contact the MS program, I get some consultation from them. Not necessarily the, to see the patient, but at least get consultation, have these been appropriate treatments, what else could happen for this person? So this is the, the other, so then, so then there is, there used to be a 10 day waiting period for MAID for, uh, but since C7, there's no waiting period if you're dying, if you have reasonably foreseeable natural death, but for not reasonably foreseeable, as I said, 90 days minimum. And there is a possibility now when people have got reasonably foreseeable natural death to have a waiver so that you can sign your consent ahead of time, if it's within usually 90 days, we see this in Saskatchewan, that you're planning to have made, that you could sign ahead of time, give consent ahead of time, and someone could start the process. I've done this twice, where people are completely out of it. I think both strokes in the end, where a person could then not consent. So that was another new thing with C7. It's not used often, but sometimes. So. Uh, so this is why we all have to talk about this. This is becoming much more common. And in the first few years, this was a linear increase in numbers. If you look at the 22 numbers are not out yet for the, for the country, but, but what we're seeing really on a provincial basis across the whole country is more exponential numbers. So the numbers are really, really increasing. None of us will be untouched by this. 
we will have we will have friends, we will have colleagues, we will have patients, we will have parents who will access this. So increased numbers across, very much different across the country. Not surprising to anyone, uh, BC has highest numbers, percentage of total deaths that are made. Um, and then after the Quebec, Quebec and, and BC, they're the heads. And we're on the lower end. You can see here Saskatchewan is on the lower end, as is Newfoundland. So we have a lower percentage, although in all of the provinces it's going up right now. So Saskatchewan, so this is Saskatchewan. I got some of these stats from a wonderful MAID program. We have a wonderful MAID program, which is located within the health line. And I think it's very appropriate there because for people who have other medical issues that might need looking at, they have close contact with people who have access to all sorts of resources. I really love the way that was situated once the provincial health a MAID program got started. It was put within the health line since um, October 2018. So you can see the numbers, a little bit of up and down in the numbers, but overall our numbers are going up across the country and most of our people have had cancer. So these numbers are largely still based on track one patients, which are ones dying quickly, largely cancers, awful cancers, where people are dying miserable, horrible deaths. So yeah, uh, two days ago, I'm out doing, we do a lot of home, I do a lot of home visits. A uh, woman had metastatic cancer, it's everywhere. She's in constant pain. She's got pain medications. It's one of those few where even with pain medications, unless she's very sedated, her pain's not covered. She doesn't want to be sedated. She doesn't want to be, be sleepy. And she's just awful, right? Terrible, terrible. And she can't get up anymore, can't get to the bathroom, it's terrible. And then other ones, all these other stuff, ALS, I see a lot of ALS patients. The other one, the second one I saw on, on this week, um, Tuesday, was ALS, end stage, can't get up, starting to choke, um, can't swallow the, get the saliva out, um, feeding tube, can't eat anymore, can't go to the bathroom. He said his dignity is terrible. He used to be an autonomous guy. He was a farmer. He's a heavy, strong guy. They have to now get family members to lift this guy. He's got lifts set up. He can't get up to, he's got diapers. He calls them adult diapers. He's, is, there's no dignity for him. And he just wants to be gone. So these, are, uh, these conditions were based on largely the track ones. We call track one, we use them for seeables. So so then most people in the older adult, older categories, this is why I mentioned we're getting older, we're all dying more, and a few very young ones, not very many, um, but, but um, most really in that middle age group, not too many of the very oldest, because there aren't very many people over 90, right? So, so the number of them are not that big there. So it's kind of an, it's an elderly thing happening. And, and so the suffering, so, I'm an obsessional person, so I collect everything in my own my own data. I write notes, and um, and then I look at them, and I audit myself. And sometimes med students do projects with my data. And what we discovered, we all thought it would be pain, and it wasn't. It pain is what people often talk about to get eligible. But what really bothers them is this non-physical stuff. It's the existential stuff. It is the loss of autonomy. You can't go, go to the bathroom by yourself. Somebody, as a woman so eloquently put, I have to wait an hour for somebody to wipe my ass before, and, and I can't go to the bathroom by myself. I don't wanna live like this. This, 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 and then the isolation, the loneliness of not getting out. You can't go out anymore, I can't get out of bed. Um, that lack of meaning and sense of usefulness, um, the burden sense to others. You don't want to see your family there every day. You want your family to do well. Their family, we care about our families, and we don't want our families to see day by day us slipping further. And many of, uh, many of our patients worry about the death that's coming, which is why we have a lot of this back pocket made. Have you guys heard of this? I know our maid folks do. Back pocket made. What this is, is people applying for a maid, and they, they actually would rather like to die naturally, but they wanna make sure they have all the paperwork done in case it doesn't go well, and then they don't ever do it because they have that comfort of knowing they could. And that's back pocket made because you were you gonna choke to death, the way maybe you saw your mother die. And that previous experience of difficult death is a really important one. We've seen our parents die, difficult deaths. 
We don't want that. So that turns out to be a far stronger driver than the physical symptoms because the physical symptoms, many of them, we can treat them. Maybe not ideally. And we've got Dr. Hagistovropoulos here who's done a lot with pain in long-term care especially and interested in how pain might drive this. And yes, some of them are really driven by pain, but much more probably is the strong driver is this existential stuff. So... Now, we're having these two categories of people, reasonably foreseeable natural death, the not reasonably foreseeable, they're really different groups. So reasonably foreseeable, most of us can live with this because we know they're dying, we can see we've made our peace with, it was difficult, I had difficulty making my peace with this because we never trained thinking we would actively help people die. It was difficult, but we may, I made my peace with this. When people are already dying, they're dying a difficult, horrible death. I can live with this. Now, not reasonably foreseeable, very different. So these are people. So these are people I've seen. Morbid obesity, two of them I've seen. Actually, three maybe. Cerebral palsy, two of them. Neither of them ended up having made, by the way. Most of these folks, you work like heck to find other resources for them so that they can have a good life because we all think they shouldn't be dying. So cerebral palsy, I've seen two. Once, 20-year-old cystic fibrosis guy. We got some mental health stuff set up for him. He's not done made. Um, spinal cord injuries. Crohn's disease. One woman who doesn't want to try any medications because she's distrustful of the medical system. She probably would be very comfortable with some new biologics. She doesn't want to try them. So she understood that both of us said we weren't comfortable with this because we don't think it's an irremediable thing. I we. You know, it, it's just she hasn't challenged it, but we feel that it, it is not what we feel fits the spirit of that law. Two people with tinnitus, ringing in your ears. Ringing in your ears can be really difficult, blaring in your ears. So both of them are very relieved that they might now be eligible. Neither of them has done, them, done it. Needed to know, and one of them is going through trying all kinds of weird and wonderful treatments for tinnitus. Feels very comfortable doing that because he thinks maybe made is possible, but really doesn't want made. He just wants his tinnitus gone. Chronic pain, and then a few others. So you can see these people are different. These people are often socially isolated. They are disconnected from their social networks. They don't get the normative feedback that that we get when we have a bad day, we go home and uh, we say to our spouse, ah, I think I did this terribly. I never do this very well. Maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. And then our spouses or our colleagues or our friends help normalize some of those dysfunctional thinking patterns. And when we're isolated, we don't have that. And we often don't know what the interventions might be. So a lot of the track two patients we're talking to don't have a good contact, which is why I love this being in the health line, because people know what all the contacts are. And they often go on the internet for their information. We know how good that is. Or, yeah. And often increasing longstanding demoralization with their chronic illness, poor self-esteem, they feel terrible about themselves, often have poor coping skills and a little bit of impaired executive function, complex thinking, maybe they don't, don't, not able to find some of the supports and many of them don't have good supports and lots of comorbid mental illness with our track too. So just to show you that we are really struggling with some of those, we are trying to do our best, but it's very difficult. And um, so practically speaking, Many of you just want to, know, want to know practical things. Right now, Saskatchewan, I think, has the best process. I think it's a fair, just process, which, which I don't think has quite the risks of a large place that's very disconnected because we all know each other. All our data goes into the Provincial MAID program, and you can't go from person to person until you find two people who approve you because if you did that, you would bias the whole system to everybody getting MAID. And so... We, all our data goes to the provincial MAID program based in Regina. Everything I do uploads to the MAID program. These guys see everything we do. And then there is a process that can audit what we do. And auditing is very important because this should never be secret. This should all be transparent so that what we do can be seen and we can be able to hear when we don't do things well. We need that feedback. A lot of things we've done, we've changed because we've had a lot of feedback over the years. Now, some of you may not know, I know these two here weren't around in the days. In 2016, privacy told us we couldn't tell anyone this person's being assessed for made. We couldn't chart it in the chart. We couldn't tell the family doctor. So 
Rob Weiler and I, we were the originals in Saskatoon along with George Carson and Regina here. Uh, we transferred people out of palliative care without telling anybody there, because that's what we're told. We weren't allowed to chart. And all of a sudden, the patient was gone. Gone. Bang. Gone. Patient gone. Ambulance came, picked up their patient. Patient gone. And, and that meant that that patient and family had no access to the social worker works. It was absolutely great in palliative care. They had no chance to talk about the grieving process, the things they needed to do for an impending death, what social work can do spiritual care can do, crazy stuff. And in the long-term care, so we had, so this was in 2017, uh, one of my residents did a follow-up on one of the women who'd asked for a maid in long-term care in a nursing home, and there was a progress note that said, tall man in black, seen going into Mrs. X's room, closed the door, the word death uttered on multiple occasions. Tall man in black left, didn't speak to us. We had no idea what was happening. My resident said, I'm kind of concerned about this. <laughs> and so I looked at this and I said, I'm not doing this anymore. This is crazy. And I had a two hour battle with, pal with privacy. They didn't back off. So I had a little rider each time when people asked for me that I'm allowed to con let the private care, the, the t care team know. And they all signed it. So after two years of doing that, since now the MAID program it's accepted that the care team knows because they should know. They should know. This should not be secret. There should not be secret people wandering around, spiriting people off and, and doing this secretly because if you do this, bad things can happen. We should never accept that. So thank God we now chart everything. This is now known and it should be and there's an auditing process. There's, a, there's an oversight committee which is being worked on but it is an oversight committee. There is also at the federal level oversight. Okay, so how do you apply for this now? So Saskatchewan is great because we have now a centralized process. So, so you don't actually have to have a family physician who approves of MAID that refers you. So initially, it needed a referral from someone, and, and it was hard to get those referrals. Not even, not even everyone has a family doctor. So it was quite difficult to access. So now it can be directly through the MAID program. That's the number. And so if anybody has their pens, you can write this down, but that's the number we go through. And they will give you information. They can give families information. They can give patients information. They can give our, our doctors information when they want to know something. They can send out information. And they can connect patients up with assessors that are able to do their assessments wherever they are in the province. So we go to people where they are. I've been all over this province. Initially, um, there are very few people doing this, so Rob Weiler and I traveled far north of the province, far south of the province, you name it, we went there. There are more people now doing this, so it's improved, but we have good access now. We also, I think, have good processes, because I think it also, for safety, it's good that we have a central process. So we know what's happening. They're not little isolated people doing whatever they want to do. So um, direct, you can still do direct referrals. I think I may be one of the few people getting direct referrals. I get a lot of direct referrals because people know I've been doing this. And so, uh, so we have a written request people have to make that says that they, by then, have been informed of what's wrong with them, that they have bad stuff going on that's not going better. So that request should not be filled out until they've had that information that they've understood. And that's what the law says. So they have to have done this. So they make this request after they've had this information. And then we have to have a witness that doesn't have a conflict of interest, who watches them sign this, and it you know, can't be somebody in the will and somebody like that. So, so that's the beginning of the process. And so um, once you've talked to the MAID program, uh, they ensure that there has been information the patient has discussed, um, has had some information given to them, looks for some records and so on, then there's a sheet that's given out to people that can fill this out. And uh, this is what it looks like right now. Might be changing a bit over time, but we uh, we fill it out for proxies. Some ALS patients can't write, so there could be a proxy involved with the patient in the room and the proxy um, writing it at the request of that patient. So that's the form. That's step one. And then two of us have to say this person fits a criteria, and the two of us have to be either doctors, nurse practitioners. And we have to say if they're either track one, reasonably foreseeable death, or track two, not reasonably foreseeable, 
We have to ensure that they're making a capable, well-informed, voluntary, and stable request. The law doesn't say stable, but it should be. It shouldn't be someone um, transiently saying they want to die each time they come in with a pneumonia. I have a lot of patients, by the way. They come in really sick, and every time they come in sick, they say they want to die. And within two days of antibiotic treatment, they don't want to die. So this should be a stable request. We do not jump into this with potentially treatable conditions like pneumonia on top of a COPD, for example. And I've seen a lot of those, that people are very, very distressed. We don't think clearly when we're very distressed. So it has to be um, well thought through. And so it could be straightforward, could be many visits. So I've had people that, um, like this woman I told you, two years. And I had a lot of, there was a lot of effort went into her. And some of them many months, many visits, and others very quick. So ones that are dying these awful deaths, one visit, very clear cut. That this is very straightforward. So sometimes we need others to come in and we can get um, assistance from occupational therapy that might do some testing, social work. Um, we're lucky to have a social worker in our MAID program who is Deborah Wisniak here and they're hiring a second one in, in Saskatoon. And so we have access to some resources which we, we actually quite often use. Deborah also does some things which we'll talk about afterwards in terms of grief support. So two of us see, and then um, if, if, we're, if we don't agree that they're eligible, a person can have a third assessment, but they can't keep asking for more assessments in Saskatchewan. Now, the law doesn't say this. So if you are in Ontario and other places in the, problem in the country, you, you possibly could, but I've always felt this is bad because you could then find two people somewhere in East Timbuktu who will agree to you being eligible after you've gone through eight people who say you're not. So it shouldn't be that way. So, so we can ask for a third, and then if we're still unclear, we can convene a meeting to talk this through. Sometimes it's a bit complicated. We don't always agree on everything. So just a little bit on the capacity to make our decisions, and I do a lot of capacity teaching, so maybe more than you want to hear, but this is important for me because you have to understand um, what's going on with you, what your health choices are. So we all have a certain amount of abilities at a certain time, and we have certain vulnerabilities, and then we have to be given the right information in a way we can internalize it. So we have to know what our choices are for our cancer treatment, the ALS, what are the access to, to support. ALS, lots of stuff now with our Breathe Assist machines, our ALS team that's, that does all kinds of neat stuff now. You have to know this information and you provide it in a way they understand it. And you have to do that before your patient can make an informed decision. And then of course there are these emotional influences that happen when you're really distressed, you've just got your pneumonia, you can't breathe, I gotta die, and this is not when we jump into this because that's a distortion of what we normally would think. And so then there's some external influences. I had a few like that where a daughter kept phone holding up signs to her mother what she's supposed to answer. I eventually kicked her out. And I've had a few like that. One complained about me. Dr. Thorpe kicked me out of the room. So, but it has to be that person. External influences both ways. And so the more common thing is a family member talking the patient out of this or trying to do that. Much more common than trying to talk them into it. So then always we're in this autonomy protection thing. So this person, is this person vulnerable? Is this person making a decision because they feel bad about themselves? They don't have access to resources. Um, how do I weigh their wish for autonomy? So it's this constant continuum. And we, we think too about the stringency of our criteria depending on the context here because somebody's dying with a brain cancer glioblastoma within a few months, I'm not gonna expect a really high level of capacity, but somebody who comes to me with fibromyalgia, we've got a few of those who wanna die, they gotta be really, really capable and very consistent over not just today. And if they're losing a lot of years, there's a high risk there. So, we're careful with this. So, so I do a lot more on capacity for people, people who, are capa who are assessors, and we're doing a lot of this. We're trained during these training guidelines right now, so we can do more of that across the country. But So you guys don't need to know all of this, but working on it. So what do we do? We prepare. Where do people want to die? Do they want to die at home? Do they want to die in hospital? Do they want to go somewhere? And in Saskatoon, hospice is Catholic. You can't die there. But Regina, you could die in hospice. And so I think it's at John Booth, right? In, is it? No, where is it? 
That they are conscientious objectors. You have a, at the West Canna. Okay, so at the West Canada, people can go. Um, so different choices people have where they want to die. And so we talk about that. I've done this for a long time. I've had all kinds of strange things. Um, my poor, long-suffering husband, um, we have an acreage, and one of my ALS patients absolutely want to die outside. He's an old farm guy, and he wanted to die with a cigarette in his mouth. And he was at the Royal University Hospital. He said, Dr. Thorpe, take me out to Watson Trail right by the river bank. I want to die there. Just put me in a wheelchair, then throw a blanket over my head and take me up to the, the morgue. And I said, well, all these people out there don't want to end up on social media. I said, oh, I don't care. I said, well, I care. It's like, you know, there's scads of people biking by night, you know, these people with their cameras. So I said, no, well, no. So he said, well, okay, so what about the back door of the hospital? Just the smokers are there. They won't care. I said, well, no. So anyway, so this guy is getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Finally, REH is sick of him. They send him to City Hospital, which is where my office is. We have long-term, sort of long-term waiting beds. He's there. Then he decides he still wants to be outside. He's not going to die inside. He wants a cigarette. And so finally, I said, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Do you want to come to my acreage? <laughs> so... Yeah, sure. So his whole family, his psychologist, he had a psychologist, he had a nurse who came with him, had a social worker who came, he had this whole contingent of people, all his family came, they all came. My husband cleared out, he hid behind a bluff with the dogs until it was all over. Text, I had to text him, so he died on my, on my acreage, on the, on the driveway where he could see the fields, the open fields, and he had a cigarette in his mouth. He died that way. And then he went to the next day, I get a call from the, the coroner, who, the, the pathologist said, Lillian, is this the new thing now, dying with a cigarette in your mouth? This guy showed up in the morgue with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> so I have a lot of these stories. My other, one of my other ones, she wanted to die with her horse. So she had a husband. So I said, well, yeah, and your husband probably. She said, well, not necessarily my husband, but with the horse. So very close to my horse. So, so I actually, my acreage is right by that particular stable. So, well, anyway, she actually died before it came to that. And I was a little bit disappointed because, you know, I thought that would be the first time we've had a horse made. Anyway. So, anyway, so where we do this, we try to be very person-centered. We really do everything we can to make it fit a person. And we, we talk about when, how do people want to do this, when, and I mean, I'm not union, so it's when, like for me, it's whenever, and um, so whatever, and wh who do you want there? Do you want your family there? Do you want friends? Do you want your pets, your animals there? Horse never now, I'm not disappointed. Dogs often, cats. So we talk about this. Um, we now have this advanced consent arrangement when we're afraid people will lose capacity and they're dying within short period of time and they can fill this out. And I, yeah, as I said, I used this. And then we talk about transfers. So if you're in a Catholic facility, you can't have it there. And we have to talk about where to transfer you to. We do a lot in our hotel in Parktown in Saskatoon. They're very made supportive and you have a beautiful view of the river. And then if somebody doesn't want to die, have that home bed with somebody who died there, don't want to think about it all the time, that hotel room is actually that is a good choice for some people who don't want that or if they don't want to, if they think it affects the sale of their house somebody's died there and then i we had initially lots of discussions with the management because i thought oh how are they going to feel about us bringing people in you know their ambulances and body bags going out and so oh, people die all the time in hotels <laughs> who knew who knew? Apparently they do. And they have a service entrance for the, the body bags and the Who knew? So we've done a lot in the hotel. And um, yeah, various places. So transfer is very painful for people that have mats of the metastatic cancer in their spine hurts and ambulance is bouncing. I don't like transfers, but some places too, um, don't work well if that our transitional care, you know, a lot of people have dementia, they wander in and out of rooms, I don't do it there. So Many reasons we might transfer someone, and we talk through that. And then with privacy, we make sure people know we're charting this now. And we chart everything. I document everything. As these guys know, I write a detailed consult note for every patient I see because I like to audit what I've done myself. And I have medical students audit it, and they go to the family doctor. So they know what I've done. So this is the advanced consent arrangement form. You can fill this out. You initial it. And then, so we don't need a witness, but this is what the form looks like currently. And on the day, you usually two of us go. 
And that helps us. It's initially too, it was very necessary for our own emotional support. This was very difficult when we started doing this. I didn't sleep much of the night when I first did cases. Even when I knew that horrible death and I knew first for them, they were at peace, but it was difficult. And so now two of us go pretty well always if it's in the community, in hospital, there's staff there to help us, one of us one of us goes, but usually two in the community and we support, my most common role is to support families when I'm there and I usually give them my cell phone and I often communicate with them afterwards and before and I find that it's a good role for geriatric psychiatry to um, have that sort of support for families, I like that role. Um, I'm less often the person who gives the drugs, and but um, my colleagues, the anesthetists, they do this these drugs all the time. They're their drugs, and they're quite comfortable doing that. We have a few in Saskatoon, three of them. Anesthetists, one nurse practitioner, myself, and Regina, we've got a few people. Dr. Carson was the original one. We've got a few palliative care docs who do sometimes, and a few others now. I haven't kept track of them. These guys will know. And then we do the medical certificate of death, which does not say suicide. It is not considered assisted suicide for people who are dying. They are dying and they are choosing when and how to die. This is different from suicide. And then we um, communicate with the physician. We let them know what happened. And um, we, uh, the funeral home gets notified. They pay for funeral home as usual. So we did not used to let the, we used to not tell the family physician, but now we do, which is much, much, much better. And we let um, home care know and palliative care know, because otherwise we had one case where we weren't supposed to tell them palliative care nurse shows up, knock, knock, hello, I'm here to look after, and there's a dead person in the room. In the, so this is obviously bad stuff, so. Okay, and how long, I gotta stop talking soon, right? Let them ask some questions. What a time am I supposed to shut up? I'm almost done. Keep going. Okay. If you if you get really bored, you can get up and leave too. <laughs> I'll, I'll understand. You could see I could go on for a long time. I have a lot of really interesting anecdotes. But um, anyway, so this is what we do. These are the drugs: anesthetic drugs, high doses. So midazolam, like Valium, short acting, that puts a person to sleep within often less than a minute. They fall asleep normally. While they're asleep normally, the rest of the stuff goes in. Propofol is the main drug. Do you guys know who, what famous person died with propofol, by the way? Yeah. Michael Jackson. Very toxic drug in high doses. So he, he was abusing it, or his doctor was abusing it, or something or other. And so high, high doses, much more than usual, given stops everything. And then at the end, rocuronium is a muscle blockader, stops muscle twitching and so on. And so that's what we give. It's a standardized stuff, and, and it's usually from the main pharmacy in an area. So And you have to be an approved person to get it. So you can't just go in there and say, hey, I like a bag of made drugs. And uh, you can't just do that. You have to be approved, so there's a bit of a process for that. And we won't talk a lot about that. We'll talk, we talk about that with the assessors, but not with this crowd. But there's a bit of process. You have to be on a list to be approved. And we're only doing IV right now. So oral does not always work. It takes a few hours, and often a person vomits it up, and then they're in a coma, and then what, right? So there was um, one infamous case from the south of the province, we shall not mention who it was, but gave the original, some people were giving oral, and gave a big oral prescription barbiturates, and gets a call a while later, um, and I can't remember all the exact details, so they might be slightly off, but a call from the wife saying, my husband finally took it, he's not dead yet, and I think he took it a, long, a while back, like maybe a day even, it's certainly, certainly many hours. And so what do you do then? So we're basically just doing IV, just as you do in anesthesia, and always, always is a peaceful death. So only doctors, nurse practitioners can give this. Anyone can help and support the process, but to give the actual drugs, it's us doctors and nurse practitioners, but other people can help, and nobody needs to be involved with this, because as I said at the beginning, People have very emotional reactions to this. It is okay not to be involved with this. It is completely okay. Then this is what we have to see on medical certificate of death. We used to have to tick off suicide as manner of death until we had a Ducobor woman who died a difficult cancer death and her daughter was a lawyer. Well, we were unsuccessful for two years to get this change and that lawyer, she knows how to do it. And so I think she was fairly 
strongly voiced towards the chief coroner of the province and the, and the form changed. And they printed new forms, a little box that says unclassified so that eHealth knows it was made, but it retains some privacy for the patient. So that's what we do. We fill it out. It does not say suicide. So which means it doesn't, has not ever affected um, uh, things like insurance. Because if you end your life by suicide, usually within two years of a new insurance policy, they don't cover you. So, so this is good. And then there's follow-up. So, so the follow-up, we are so lucky in Saskatchewan. We have a provincial team. We've had Deborah now. Well, before Deborah, we didn't help this. We, we cobbled together support for people. And that was a lot of work to do. And now all I need to do is send Deborah a little, little stressed email saying, like last week, this woman is so distressed. Can you call her right away, please? And she really needs you. And Deborah knows a lot of resources. And um, I, I know we're probably not in a rush afterwards. Some people might want to talk to Deborah as well. But she knows a lot of the grieving resources that are out there. And so, so there are a number of grief groups around, some individual services, some group things. And so it just depends on the person. Lots of our patients actually don't want that. If you have a very supportive family, you don't necessarily. But, but some do. So that's our follow-up, and I'm just going to tell you the last few minutes, the challenges we have is that these, these difficulties that um, between people who are the far end, the far end, and some of these folks who had dinner with me was hearing, hearing my rant about a far end person who feels that people don't have to try any drug, it's the right not to try any drug, and if... You know, if they then deteriorate, they become eligible for MAID, and I have difficulty with this. Um, autonomy, and then people who really feel it should never happen. And this is this is this difficult thing. And then the other ethical pillar of justice, that should people who ask for MAID jump to the head of the queue? Because of their sayings, saying if I have 24-7 care in my home, I don't need MAID. I need it, because otherwise I'm going to ask for maid. So, so there was a woman in the news like this. This is the Winnipeg woman. This is a woman in the papers who chose to die and said that she struggled for, she wanted full-time home because she had a dog, and if she didn't get around-the-clock care, she wanted maid. And she was offered to move somewhere where she'd get this, but she wanted it in her own home. So do we jump queue for all over all the other ones of our poor little sweet people who are out there waiting patiently for uh, home care home care is not unlimited and so how do we balance this so anyway so some of these other challenges we have here can we mention it it's tough if they don't know about it do we we don't want to look like we're suggesting it um, but people have the right to know their options how do we bring it up that they don't feel that we're pushing them into this can people purposely stop eating and drinking to make themselves eligible? Some people think they should be able to. Um, how do we involve families? I always like to involve families because they can give me useful information and also I can prepare them for what's happening. The guy with ALS I saw this week didn't want to tell his three kids. I said, this is really hard on them because they're going to find out you're dead all of a sudden. And they were not there. They might have wanted to be there. This is really hard on them. Do you really want to do this? And so, of course, he doesn't have to. But, but most people, when you talk them through it, will agree that their families have the right to know. They have the right to be prepared for that death. And sometimes it takes them a while to get their head around it. So it's not legally required. Traumatic spinal cord injuries, people are traumatized. They don't know that most people after spinal cord injuries adapt. The suicidality after spinal cord injury goes down after a few years if you have good resources. So those are all a challenge for us. Dementia, huge challenge for us. I've had a few people with dementia have made, but it's only possible in that intermediate little tiny area where you've lost a lot of capability, but you're still able to say what you want. But after that, you lose insight that you even have dementia. So made for dementia and made for mental illness. This is a big struggle we're having. I, you can just imagine how difficult this is now for us. We're having endless meetings trying to figure out how we're going to navigate this. We don't know right now. We're working on it. And so um, some of the other stuff is in here. I think you're going to have access to the tape. But some of the stuff like advanced requests. Rick Vance requests the, the, the report from last night said they're going to they're gonna get approved. I think it's also problematic because we don't know a long time ahead what we're going to be like. Did I think 10 years ago I'd be involved in MAID? Never. 
Never. So we actually don't know what we want. And, and so how do we do this? And when people have dementia, and that's the most common reason for advanced requests, they forget they have dementia and they're not always wanting to die. And then the family says, but you said when you were well, and our a lawyer says that was their, that was their request when they were capable, you should be fully through, fulfilling through, but they're walking around actually not asking to die. And some of them are really agitated, couldn't even get a needle into them, couldn't even get their regular drugs into them. So it's going to be pretty complicated. And so people want it, but to do it, it's going to be complicated. And then transfers I mentioned. So I meant to finish early so you could all talk about it, but I'm in a rush. Okay, so anything goes, guys. Um, um, it's... Um, People have any experience themselves? Anyone who knows someone who's had maid, by the way? I, you two can't talk because they've talked to so many people. But other than those two, yeah? You've had some? Yeah. And how, how did? In fact, I know the person you're talking about who woke up. You have what? I know the person who woke up. Okay. Okay. So you, who woke up? Oh, dear. Okay. Anyone else an experience? It, that would be unusual, but um, waking up might happen with oral. Yes. Question. What happens when you turn down somebody? The request is made and, and they're turned down. So what happens when you turn down a request? This is the million dollar question. Two people I've turned down ended their lives in suicide. So turning down people is a like the outcome is not good for people often. So, so what, we, what I tend to do is to say not yet, not yet, instead of no. Because people know it feels very final. They never have an option. Saying not yet, um, not yet, I'd like you to try some things before I feel comfortable. Then often people actually try some things and they may not end up having made. And so I don't like to say no like that. So, but it could be quite bad outcome. We've got a, one of my projects, research projects I'm involved in a national project is looking at people who would like to have made for soul mental illness, who know they're not eligible, how they feel about this. And, and it's difficult for people when you're turned down. You really feel you want to end things. So, so we're all struggling a little bit. Uh, the second, I had one who went all over the news because uh, we said no, I said no, and um, her husband went and found lots of drugs, got them all together, and lay in bed beside her while she died, took them over. It was all over the news. That was one. The other one was one where the guy had threatened suicide over years if his wife wouldn't take him back. He was a difficult guy, and this was not new. She threatened a lot, and then he eventually asked for me if she wouldn't take him back, and I said, that's not a good reason. And of course, and he, he I ended his life by suicide. So yeah, it's, what do you do? I don't know. I mean, if people threaten suicide, is it, do we give aid because people are threatening suicide? Most of us don't think so. But what we're doing is trying to hook them up with resources so that we could hopefully get them to a stage where they can live a bit of a life. Most people are very successful. A lot of people I've seen that were, were, and that have talked to me have never done it, and still not, but they usually say, don't take me off your list. <laughs> yeah. Is there a period, a legal period between when you can, if you're told no, no or not yet, when you can ask again? There's no legal time, so the question is there a legal period before you can. There's no legal ruling for this. This will be for each province to decide what they can do. And so we're all thinking about this, like how it's going to be case-based, because if somebody is actually having a disease that is going to be fairly fast, progressive, they're in the early stages, don't have loss of capability yet, then that would be quicker that they can apply. But if it's something like you know, fibromyalgia, it might be quite a while. So there's nothing legal. But um, it's going to be case-based that we're going to be sitting, talking down with our groups. So we have a lot of discussions with our groups about when we do. We have a guy right now, a lawyer, who two of us declined him. We got a third person to see, these guys know who that is. And we got a third person to see also declined. This person really didn't meet eligibility criteria. So um, he's now phoned again. And I think we're going to say a year because he's nothing, nothing happening fast with him. But, but not a blunt no. It's a not yet. Yeah? Oh, wait, who was first? I don't know who's first. You, you're going to. 
I don't know. You know who's first. Go ahead. No, not yet, not yet. If you, you have to actually have dementia, you have to be at a state where it significantly impacted your functioning and you still have to know enough to give informed consent. So it's a little sliver of time within which right now you can do MATE. I've had a number like this though, and, but more of them have applied and then lost, a bill, lost insight that they had dementia. Not asking for it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what, was it you or whoever? other than physical loss of capability. Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the, what we found is actually the sense of, for people who are losing autonomy and losing control. So having control um, is a big thing. So people who have illnesses where they eventually lose total control, like ALS, where you can't breathe anymore, you can't swallow your saliva, you start choking. So those diseases where you're just losing control or cancer that's progressing fast all over the place, those are the kinds of drivers to it. Um, people asking for MAID. The, I, I, one of my summer projects with a student, I pulled out all these, I do these obsessional dictations, I pulled out the word control, and the word control was actually one of the strongest predictors of somebody asking for MAID. It was very strong in there that, that what people wanted is a control over the dying process. They know they're dying, they want to control it. They don't want to die in this awful, awful way where then they're, they're, they're vomiting, they're choking, and their family members are trying to get there at three in the morning and half of them don't get there. Or they have a massive bleed out. One of the early women I saw had cancer from the tongue wrapped around her left internal carotid, and it was on the way to eroding into that carotid artery. It's a huge artery. And she was told how she would die is suddenly by an absolutely massive bleed out. That uh, was a patient at one of the hospitals. And she, the nurses told me, this is intensely traumatizing. Everybody is out of control at that point. They've got all these blankets, dark blankets, because there's blood everywhere. And everybody is completely frantic. The family members are completely distraught. This total lack of control. Awful, awful. Yeah. Yeah, is there something you can control how you die? And you don't often want, often don't want to die right away, but you want to know that when it gets bad, you have that control. Yeah. Uh, so I was doing a little Can you just talk about a little bit louder? Sorry, I'm getting rather old and deaf. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Give it a go. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you better there. Okay, I'm gonna move closer to you. So I'm going to go back now just to, so 
So I know you must be in here. So this is a question about advanced consent for dementia. And there's a really good question. Right now it's not legal yet. And the bill last night that came out is suggesting that this should become legal. How do we how do we safeguard this too? And because if you give advanced consent, how do we decide that this is really an appropriate thing? So this is what I just want to show you. So so the issues I have with this, these are all the same. This is the worry, right? So this is this thing that came out last night, which I just added in and I wanted to go to the advanced consent bit and um, so the advanced consent um, uh, independent all the criminal sorry um, oh yeah here we go so okay so um, so uh, yeah so advanced consent so this is the issue so so when so I actually presented this, and I, and I said that a lot of people that I see in long-term care are actually quite happy walking around. And they might have said 10 years ago, if they filled out an advanced directive, that if they ever got dementia, they want to have made. But now, they're walking around, they're enjoying music, they're walking around, they're smiling. So when you read through this massive document, this is all openly available, by the way, you hear the family comments that talked about this. So here's one of the comments I put in. So this is a daughter who says, to be quite honest, I don't believe in happy dementia. Contented dementia amounts to symptoms of a disease being expressed. It's not the person's content, but that brain plaques have disrupted their neurotransmitters, causing what appears to be expressions of joy. So a person may look happy, but the daughter feels they must be unhappy because the neurotransmitters make them not. And the other one said, um, um, yeah, so um, um, happy dementia is a trap. Um, she smiles not because she's not in pain, but because the disease has not taken away her ability to do so. So people are saying, family members, that um, this family member of theirs is actually unhappy. They may be smiling, but they're really unhappy. And so this is the thing, like, like as an assessor and a provider, I am not going to hold somebody down who's happily walking around and singing because a family tells me they're actually depressed and miserable because they can tell. So, so this is the problem. Like this is, this is gonna have to be put together really carefully. Like how are you gonna, so, so my suggestion, and I don't know if they even heard my suggestion because I didn't see it, my suggestions in this thing, is that um, there'd be a few situations I can see this is gonna work. So if a person then is in that intermediate stage of dementia, they fill out an advanced care request and they start saying over and over, I wanna die. So this guy right now I have in hospital at City Hospital, he's saying over and over I wanna die. So if he had filled it out, I'd be okay with that. Cause he's actually really miserable, he just wants to die. And then that's one category. The other category is people in the very late stages when they're completely out of it. They're lying in bed, they're incontinent, they're being fed, they got a tube fed, they're doing absolutely nothing anyway. I'm okay with that. But in between, the, a lot of them are agitated, aggressive, no. So how are we gonna do that? Sit on him and inject him, not gonna happen. And I hope that becomes illegal. And are happy ones walking around? I don't think that should happen. So how are we going to develop this? So the, the, this report is talking about developing good guidelines. That's, it's all gonna be in the guide. It's all gonna have to be developed. It's gonna be challenging. It is a worry. It is a worry. Like, you know? You know, my, my father-in-law had Alzheimer's. He was quite happily walking around. And you took him out, and for a visit, he actually wanted to point it back. He wanted to go back to Sherbrooke because he had the guys he was always sitting with. He, he, he had dementia. But, you know, 20 years ago, before he got dementia, he would have probably said he wouldn't want to live through it. And actually, then he would point. He, you could see him going to the group of guys always sat together, actually enjoying his life. So, so are we the same people that said that we think 20 years before we say we will want this, but are we exactly the same people 20 years later? We're actually in that situation. Do we actually have informed consent? Do we know what we'll be like? We don't. So this is, these are the problems I have with advanced consent. I think it'll be challenging. I know people want it. And I understand why they want it, because it's scary to think they can end up lying there day in, day out. So I think it's okay to have it become legal, but I think we'll have to have really good guidelines. I don't want this legal for people who are happily walking around and, and the family member thinks they're actually miserable. They just look happy because their neurotransmitters are gone. Great question. I'm going to come closer because. What difference does it make whether you go through May or through just harming yourself, committing suicide? I, I know different, but what, what do your patients more often report as the reason for going the May direction rather than suicide? Yep, great question. 
question. So the question was about you know why you choose MAID rather than killing yourself. So so this was actually in this a qualitative study we're doing with with um, Alberta and British Columbia, and we have an Ontario woman. So we're doing qualitative interviews with people, and we ask ask that like what and the interviewer asked that that how why do you choose MAID versus suicide, for example, and what they say is that it's controlled. They know suicide doesn't always work. They could end up in a worse state. They could end up brain damaged in a worse state. They also talk about trauma to your families. So, so risk harm reduction, that came out as a theme in a lot of people we interviewed. Actually, I say we, we I didn't do any of that work. I just looked at the interviews. But the work, so, so they talked about harm reduction because they said, uh, you know, I don't want my families to be traumatized by finding me hanging from the rafters. I want this to be peaceful. I want to have it all talked through. I want to make sure they're ready for this and they're not traumatized. So that harm reduction was a strong theme in this. Harm reduction and control and knowing it would work. And also they talked about having it sanctioned as opposed to doing something on your own which would then be seen as unsanctioned. And they feel, felt that a number of them said that it would be um, societally sanctioned better than they hang themselves. Now, it is traumatizing. You find someone like the um, the um, coroners that um, we used to have the coroners come to all our cases, and I did a session for them on maid, and they said it's absolutely traumatizing. They what they find? They find people who've been hanging there for three months. They've had. We had um, one of my colleagues who was a very strong conscientious objector to maid, and he came to my office. He was really distraught because one of his neighbors had cancer or I forget what was wrong with him, but he ended up waiting until his family was gone and blew his brains out in the garage. His family came home with the kids. There was brain all over and blood all over the garage. And so maid would have been a far less traumatizing thing for everyone. So, so this is what people talk about, why they choose one or the other. Um, yeah, I guess it's still a medicalization of death. Um, the less medicalized form would be taking your own oral medications, which is why some people want that. But what do you do then when they vomit up some of that? They're on their own in their place where they want to be at the beach or in the, on the lake, and they're then in a coma, and they're choking, aspirating their saliva, and nobody is there to basically end everything. So what do you do with this? So we have the made that our college and uh, physicians and surgeons said that if you ever do oral, you have to have some, you have to be there the whole time. But so we're not doing oral, but but that's a super good question. Mm-hmm. So my question is, she had gone through the process, filled out the paperwork, her family had been involved for months and months and months, um, and the day of, she could no longer give verbal consent. Mm-hmm. She was too far gone, and it got to the point where um, these people in her home are saying, this is no longer a mm-hmm. viable option. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what happens now in those situations? Like, what is made as a program doing to um, make sure the families like properly consent? Yeah. So, so we have this advanced consent arrangement form here. So, if a person is really likely to lose capacity, high risk of it, they can they can sign ahead of time so that even if they're right out of it on that day, you could still go ahead. Now, you can't do this at a very long time out because the government said they, they actually it's not legal to do advanced directives yet. Advanced directives would be the far off thing. So theoretically, when I die, when I get this, so you can't be far off. So here we've said most places say around like a few 
few months, within a few months. Now, what happens if people keep putting it off? You'd have to then re-sign that form because if you didn't re-sign that form, it could be that you might not want it anymore. So if it's really a long time ago, we really don't know what those person's wishes are. So if a person keeps putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, they eventually also would lose that possibility because they uh, could no longer even renew the advanced consent arrangement form. And that happens. I've had a few like that. Now, that being said, if somebody is really uh, clearly has asked for a maid, has been consistent the whole time. So one of my patients, young woman, youngish woman, still had two ki three kids. She had ALS. And she was so bound to live the last possible minute she could. And two of us saw her. We made a few visits, very consistent, family all, all supportive. She wanted to live as long as possible. She couldn't even move her head anymore at the end. All she could do is, is grimace. We went with that because she then called me. So I give them people my cell phone when they're really sick like that. And so I got a call on a Friday night saying she got pneumonia. She didn't want to go to hospital. And pneumonia is the end once you have ALS because you can't bring your diaphragm down. You can't kick in. You can't cough it up. And so uh, we were there the next morning. And she, all she could do is two little grimaces or one grimace. And it was very consistent. We went with it. Wow. And in the last three, two, three days, it was like such a nose Yeah. Right? So she went from being like, yeah, like I'm ready for this, I'm ready for this. And when the nurses showed up, it was like, wow, like we can't do anything. Wow. How sad. Because she wanted to live so much for as long as possible, right? Truly. Well, I mean, like to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, and did she in the end didn't get it? Is that right? Well, she did. But I mean, like it, it was like. But questionable. So you're, you know, I think that is the case where advanced directives will be useful. Like if she had an advanced directives, that would be no issue. And that's why I think it's good that they're going to be legal. They're just going to be complicated in some cases. But I do think it's a good thing that they be legal because that would avoid that. Yeah, that is awful. I, oh my goodness, before the advanced consent arrangement was legal, we had one. This, the whole family was there from across the country. And... Um, ready to go and and all there waiting for a three o'clock time and at 12 o'clock my resident went and said hmm she's you know this is not going very well and within a completely out of it probably stroked couldn't do it the son was so distraught he is just actually threw things he's like we had to took, take him off to room on his own and just sit with him awful because they're all prepared for this they're all there and terrible yeah, that's heartbreaking. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate you Yeah, those good. Those are really good. Good things to hear. That's, that's it, it. All of those things help. Yeah. So what I, well, I I'm not sure. I guess I should go no, with Hoover. That's fine. I just want to remind people, especially as people sharing uh, personal stories, we are recording and it will be posted online. So just keep that is that's important to know. Yeah. Privacy-wise, yes. Privacy -wise. Just be careful. Whatever we say can't can't sort of. Okay, so I don't know who's next. Tom will know. I, no, I don't. You, you had somebody was. Pam. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Thorpe, what I see as a registered nurse with the provincial main program is, and I know the answer, but people wonder when do they phone? Why do we see like the large continuum of people? who I know are dying on the phone when um, we have to do like the intake, we have to do the information session, and then we have to get out the assessors because um, the assessors have other jobs as mm -hmm. well, like general practitioners, palliative care doctors. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I as a registered nurse, I scramble to get those 
physicians, mm -hmm. those nurse practitioners, to see the patients. And why do some of them wait so long? And I, know, mm -hmm. I think I know the answer to that, I'm sure. Because they don't want to die, right? Correct. And sometimes they, too, they're in that state of denial mm -hmm. that they are going to live forever. Mm -hmm. And now is the crunch. Yep. You're right. And another question I've got for you, medical tourists. Medical what tourists? Medical tourists. Mm -hmm. From other provinces phoning up. Interesting. Oh, so I don't know if you could hear this. Medical tourists from other provinces phoning wanting to be assessed like here. I say, I'm, I'm Saskatchewan born and bred, but say um, someone phones from Ontario because they're told it's going, it's going to take so long. So now they phone into our program. Wow. Hmm. Just an FYI. Ah, I didn't and even I'm, know that. And we, we're getting, um, right now I'm the only registered nurse Wow. And we are getting busy. I, my colleague will substantiate that. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we are getting busy. Yeah, the program is going to have to figure out what to do with that. So that's an interesting thing, though, that are people in other provinces calling, because actually we do great. We are quick. Like, we are very responsive to patients. And other provinces, sometimes it's weeks before you get to even see someone. So that's why that's happening, because it's a very well-run program. Yes. Mm -hmm. B B C, um, but because they're told weeks, and um, they will move here. Wow. They, yes. They yeah, move. we had one. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Interesting. So we're going to have to think about that because obviously we have to make sure we give service to our own people first. And there's only so much you can do with not, not that many people doing this, right, doing the assessments, because there are actually a lot of assessments for more than provisions, because lots of people have an assessment and then don't end up doing it. Mm -hmm. but, but then that becomes very complicated, having someone come from another province too. Where do they go? And yeah. Yeah. Just putting it out Well, there. okay. Well, I never thought of that. Wow. Mm -hmm. very closely. And what I see is all about choice. Mm -hmm. It gives them control. Mm -hmm. And once they have got their assessments and they are deemed eligible, it's just like a weight has been taken mm -hmm. off their shoulders. And many of them die without mm -hmm. me because they, they know they can go palliative care for me. Mm -hmm. And they just have that choice. It's yeah. giving them control. Yeah, it's that. I don't know if you guys can hear this, all about this control, that how many people are so much more peaceful. I see that all the time. The first time we see someone, they're very distressed. And then by the time the second assessor is done, both found eligible, then when I connect with them, all of a sudden, my goodness, this person is completely different. What happened? And they're just so peaceful knowing that. They have this option. That's that control. And Deborah will probably see that. Yeah, I can start living again yeah. now that you know you can die. Yeah, they start to embrace life, they yeah. relax, and we start having fun, and doing what matters because they've the option. Yeah, so I know that you probably can't hear, but, but Deborah's talking about that how, how much of a relief this is. People are happy again, feel they can live again because they're not worrying about a difficult death all the time. And they go and do neat stuff again because they know they have control over this difficult stage of their lives. It's a very po it's, it's a positive thing. In the future.
So I had um, a lengthy meeting with the Mental Health, um, Canadian Mental Health Association, Saskatchewan branch. And so I did actually, it was going to be 50 minutes. It was two hours in the end. So so there is outreach happening. We're having, I've had meetings with a whole um, provincial psychiatry department, which included the psychology, social work, and so on. So there's a lot of discussion happening right now with that to prepare for made for soul mental illness. And we're looking at possibly having some panels maybe be put we don't, we don't know exactly how we can do this yet but there may be some panels put together multidisciplinary panels that will then look at those cases because many of them will be challenging for us they are going to be people that have tried everything and nothing works and they have difficult difficult mental illness i have a guy i had a guy who had ect shock treatments and like a lifespan like and he was in the 70s and he just didn't want it anymore and this was before made and so um what we did is we got him well one more time had a big meeting big group of people there and he told us while well, completely well what he wanted didn't want any more ACT next time he got depressed we had palliative care set up he had a peaceful death he just stopped eating and so there are people like that we are anticipating a lot more people though phoning that are young and that maybe have personality disorders antisocial personality that's what um, Netherlands Belgium is seeing people with personality disorders um, and actually interesting, they're seeing people with autism spectrum disorders that don't fit into the world very well. So we are not quite sure how we can deal with that because we're gonna have, a, there'll have be a lot of manpower to, to sort of try to assess all those people, so to assess them. So I understand, so you're saying that there is a, there's going to be a system of public education around that, or at least- Oh, there will be. Oh, there's already been lots of discussion, interactive discussion. Once it comes, like I've done just massive amounts of, see this this kind of thing, community. Next week we're doing, we talked Deborah into helping, uh, Dying with Dignity is doing a session. I'm doing a session for them. Deborah's going to help with that. I've done a massive amount of sort of community outreach. That will be happening again w more with my, Made for Mental Illness. Well, it won't happen till we know, right? Not in terms of what we can tell people, but what I've been doing is getting feedback. So this is why I we, I met. So this is a different kind of process. So right now the process is getting lots of feedback from 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 stakeholders. I I like to know what people are saying. So at lengthy psychiatry department provincially, there's a lot of feedback. I got a lot of emails back. Um, so getting feedback about because we're on that stage of trying to figure out how we can do this. And I'm on this health health Canada committee. I mean, we're meeting again tomorrow afternoon. So we've got, we had meetings with stakeholders across the country and uh, for made for soul mental illness. And so we got all of that pulled together. So right now we're trying to try to balance all this feedback we've got. Pardon? No, the expert panel published already, and the expert panel suggested that there should be then um, 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 formally sort of processes set up and guidelines, and so this Health Canada panel is in response to that um, expert panel suggesting we need to do some. So this expert panel, this panel I'm on is looking at developing professional sort of guidelines. So practice, more like practice level guidelines. And that got a lot of community feedback. We got, like, like there were people paid to put it all, pull it all together. And so we've had lots of meetings trying to pull all of that together into updated versions. So this is the stage we're at now, is sort of getting feedback from stakeholders. And then there'll be various, there've been various drafts of things. And then once the law actually changes, that's when there'll have to be some more formal education. And there'll have to be, because people have to know if, if there isn't, we're, we're, we can't possibly assess everyone. Like we have to make sure people know that they're potentially eligible. Because if they if they're all phone, like so, a lot of people phone that then are not eligible. Like we're all worrying how we're going to deal with that manpower of that. Yeah. How you view the medical system's ability to facilitate that. Yeah, so how, so the question is about the, the rising rates, when it's get, rising rates, when it's going to plateau, we don't know. Um, other places that have had it, like Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, it actually does plateau eventually. And it's not horribly high, but it does plateau eventually. And so 
you know, we're not there yet. We don't know. So this is, this is the big discussion, how we do that with manpower. But um, so a lot of my work has been with education. So I'm part of University of Saskatchewan and my, my funding is, I'm, I'm faculty. So, so I do a lot of teaching with the various levels of students, undergrad students, med students, residents, um, family medicine residents, people in early practice. So there's a lot of education because what we're trying to do is train people that then will be doing this because ideally, I think, we should have the primary care people that know patients being at least one of the two assessors because then they know the patient because a lot less work for you if you know your patient and the patients would prefer if they have a known person. So I'm doing hours of work with the teaching staff within university but then also in community because in that with a goal of increasing this kind of manpower and really is better to family docs know these people and they're right now it's hard for them because a lot of they're really they we don't have enough family docs and some people don't have a family doc and so but a lot of my family medicine residents are very keen to do this for their own patients and that's coming along. And right now, a lot of the people, there are people in some number of the places across the province are people who have come to my sessions a few years ago. This, this is how we're going to be able to do it. And this kind of sort of discussion, people hear things, talk about things, and um, this is how we go. But we have to always stay reasonable and balanced. And, and it is an area that is worrying for lots of people. And this is, it's not a straightforward thing. And we, we just keep having lots of dialogue, lots of openness, transparency. What are we doing? What should we be doing better? Getting feedback from people. So what Deborah gets a lot of feedback after deaths, um, she often calls people, what, two weeks later or something? And, and then she gets feedback from what's happened. And we've changed a lot of stuff that we've done because of feedback back. Yeah, it was, it was emotionally quite difficult to start with. There was a lot to figure out. And like, first case, nobody had done this before. Like, how do we do it? Like, there was, before it even happened, there was a lot of discussion about even what medications would be used that would always be effective, because we don't want people to, you know, potassium or something horrible where people have horrible pain. So there was a huge amount of work that went into that. And a lot of us doing a lot of dialogue between ourselves. How do we do this? This is why supporting each other, two of us going, is extremely helpful. Um, the I don't think we're too worried. I'm not too worried with... Um, um, with legal stuff, I'm pretty careful, and I document everything. I'm more likely to get sued by people whose driver's license I, I'm responsible for having taken away. They're really pissed at me. <laughs> Pardon me, like, unless it's just being taped. And people that I, I, I do incompetency work with because they think they should go home. And like that's, people, that's what people complain about. But I have had not issues. Now, some of my colleagues have had a lot of hate mail because of being involved with the mail. I haven't had any of that, but I'm a, I'm a fairly middle of the road person, as you've sort of figured out. I'm not far in either either direction. And so I haven't had that. Ellen Weave has had lots of hate mail, people in the other parts of the country telling me they're very traumatized by this. So I haven't. Yeah, so yeah, I'm not really concerned, I guess. Yeah, people, I don't know. I don't know, we're small enough, we all know each other too, and, and, and I think having transparency helps. People know that if they're upset about something I've done, they know who I am and they can talk to me, and people do, and people sometimes don't like some things, and that's good to hear, because we're not perfect. Okay, we'll make this the final question. The crowd is starting to slip away, and I want there to be enough people for a nice round of applause. Oh, good. Well, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so trying to, trying to how, do, how do we navigate between um, increasing, sort of advocating for more mental health and cultivating hope versus, 
versus having made. This is always a big thing. It was a big factor in the project we did with spinal cord injuries, which was a research project we did within interviews with a lot of people who'd had spinal cord injuries. And hope was a big thing. Like they talked about how important it was that they had people who'd gone through the process who gave them hope that you could adapt. And hope was a huge thing. And this is, um, it was really interesting. So the, these advocacy organizations of people who have lived experience, they felt, and I think they're right, that having people with lived experience go and talk to people is probably one of the most important things we do. Because it's, it's fine me talking to them, but I haven't lived that. And having someone talk to them that are in a wheelchair, and they've navigated that. They're having a good life again. They've got used to it, because people don't know. So cultivating hope is super important. And in all of our interactions. Now, it's why I think sometimes made for mental illness might be a harm reduction technique because when people have the hope they could die, this is the other thing, they have a hope they could die, they have to talk to us. So if they don't have, don't think they could ever get this, that's when they go hang themselves under the rafter or one of our nurses hung herself under a bridge and they don't talk to anyone. But if someone thinks we could help them die, they have to actually talk to us. And it's amazing what it does when you talk to someone because you, you can, your whole thoughts can get shaped by having to share them and getting that feedback with people. So at some level, I think that having made for soul mental illness might be in a way a harm reduction thing. I would not be surprised if we have a decreased suicide rates with if this is accessible to people. And many of the people who will ask will not do this because finally they get actually talked to someone and they may not even know who they approach to get supports, but, but they actually have to talk to us. The increase the age threshold? I'd say maybe from 18 to maybe 30, like only. No, probably, well, nobody's going to go for this because because 18 is adulthood and so 18 everybody's stuck on 18 so right now the discussion is lowering it so right now this big panel has said that made for mature minors and but what they've said and i agree with this is it should actually just be for track one so people are actually dying and so the difficult cancers dying a horrible death and the 17 should be the same as if you're 18 or 24 but not for people who have these lengthy, non-foreseeable deaths. And so that's what this panel has just got that put out. Which I think it's good. Um, but yeah, I don't think so. 18 are. But the point that you make is, you know, the, the sensible thing is that people are full, they don't have their fully developed prefrontal cortex yet until they're in their, probably into the late 20s. So people have more driving accidents and make more impulsive decisions and so on. So I do think we have to be more careful with those people. But to actually make it illegal for them, I think, would be difficult at this point because it's so established. Boy, and I think I'm supposed to shut up now. That's right. <laughs> um, wow. There is just so much there in terms of just not just information, but stuff that really highlights the contradictions and the challenges mm -hmm. and the complexities of all of this. So I'd ask everybody to help me thank Dr. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. The fun part is that we have a small couple tokens of our appreciation oh, for doing you. the lecture. Thank you very well, much. Lovely. Thank you all for coming.